Hey there, my name is Cassie Torresias, and eight years ago, I launched my own online graphic design studio and booked a one-way ticket to travel the world in pursuit of my own freedom-filled life. I now own a multi-million dollar online business, The Bucket List Bombshells, teaching other women how to do the same, alongside my best friend, co-founder, and podcast co-host, Shay Brown. Around here, we believe that your crazy dreams aren't crazy, and that it's time for you to start creating the life and career that you dream about too. Whether you want to travel and work remotely, or simply just want to be your own boss, it's possible to live out your passion and purpose without just scraping by. We know that this path isn't always easy to navigate though, so we're here to help you. From making a career change, starting and growing your own business, balancing life and business, and most importantly, pursuing your own freedom-filled life. Get ready for real, relatable stories and advice on your journey towards something more. We serve it up BFF style, so pour yourself that third cup of coffee and let's dive in. Welcome to the Freedom Filled Life Podcast. Hey there, it's Cassie here. I am so pumped for you to listen to Shay and I's conversation today, all about what you need to know about working remotely and traveling. Now, if you're new around here, then you might not know that almost an entire decade ago, Shay and I grabbed our laptops, packed our suitcases to work remotely from countries all around the world while running our online businesses. And to date, we've worked and traveled through over 15 countries while working remotely, like Italy, Indonesia, Mexico, Guatemala, Thailand, Australia, Spain, and so many more. Maybe you're listening and right now you find yourself with a similar opportunity, the ability to work remotely while progressing your career from wherever the heck you choose. You're probably feeling equal parts incredibly excited and nervous about the idea of working and traveling to an unknown destination. And I'm guessing the idea of checking off your bucket list in a new country might be starting to feel a little overwhelming with all of the logistics. Like, how do you find a place to rent? What's the best way to ensure that you have strong access to Wi-Fi to work? How do you build a community on the road? What are the best tools that you need to work effectively? And so many more questions that are probably swirling through your head. Our goal is that after listening to this episode, you're feeling more confident in your idea or decision to work remotely while traveling. After all, it was one of the best decisions that Shay and I ever made, both personally and professionally years ago, which is why we're such huge advocates of the remote work lifestyle that has absolutely taken off in 2021. So let's dive into our conversation. All right, Shay, I'm so excited about this conversation (laughs) because this is a topic I think a lot of people ask us about all the time. And this is perfect timing because you have actually recently made the quote unquote move, which we're going to talk about later (laughs) in this episode, but have decided to kind of pack your bags in the meantime and head to Mexico. Yeah, this is such a relevant topic for me right now. I feel like I'm living it. So I'm excited to jump in and talk about this while I'm actually doing the thing that we're talking about today. (laughs) Always helpful (laughs) when we're giving advice. But I know that for a lot of you that are listening and Shay, we were talking about this just before we hopped onto this episode is that I think this is a really relevant topic because of the current landscape of the world. And Obviously, because of COVID in 2020 and 2021 and on to 2022 now, working remotely, it has become so much more acceptable. And there are jobs that were never considered before as remote work that are now remote. You and I have friends that are bankers or people who work in universities, like typical office jobs that have continued to be coming on two years completely remote. 
Yeah. I feel like all the corporations that used to say, no, you can't work up remotely. You're not as productive. There's no systems in place. How are you going to do it? How am I going to know what you're working on? It was such like a different type of corporate environment. And I feel like so many companies have embraced almost this hybrid model too, of both in office and remote work. And I'm seeing all of my friends who work nine to fives, who are always like, how do you work online? How do you travel? And it was always, you know, we ran our own companies. We were our own bosses and they they always felt, you know, that could never happen for me. And some of these people don't feel like they want to be business owners. And so I love this new sort of hybrid way of doing business that globally has been accepted and embraced. Yes. Oh my gosh. I love that you said that because I think it has been so fascinating. You and I have been paying <laughs> attention to these major companies in the industry or even in other industries, you know, companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon, these massive companies, but also smaller companies and businesses. And like you said, some have really embraced the hybrid model of giving their employees, you know, part-time at mm -hmm. home, part-time in the office. And we have also seen companies that have transitioned 100% indefinitely to remote work because they've actually seen more productivity, more happiness from their employees. I think that has been the biggest pushback from companies that have gone back fully in office, or even those that, that have embraced some sort of hybrid model. It has been this, you know, pushback from employees now that people have been working two years from home and experience the benefits that can come with remote work. Yeah. I actually have a friend experiencing this right now. The Pat, she's in sales for a tech company and has always wanted to work remotely and travel. And they had to go remote because of COVID in 2020. And she had her best highest year in 2020. And she just beat her highest year in 2021 these past years. And they still wow. will not acknowledge that. And they still are actually making her go back to the office. And so now she is looking for other opportunities, other companies that are going to allow her that are going to see the talents that she has and what she's bringing to the table. And she's going to take that talent elsewhere. And these companies that aren't embracing that hybrid model are going to lose out on really talented people because the people who can work from home and don't have to be babysat and can be self-motivated are going to be your top employees, in my opinion. Yeah, that's such a great point. And so I think before, like you were saying, you know, it was mainly the business owners, the entrepreneurs, those of us in the early days who picked up on remote work and were we're able to actually live this creative freedom filled lifestyle. And now we're actually seeing that employees are getting to consider this lifestyle for themselves. And so that's really where this idea for this podcast episode came from. And we actually have gotten quite a few suggestions recently for this podcast episode of someone who was like, I'm actually considering making an international move because I can now work remotely. <laughs> what do I need to know? <laughs> and you and I know almost a decade in, there are definitely some things that we've learned the hard way, lots of advice that we have to give, which we're going to chat about in this episode. And so I think one of the biggest questions that comes up first is, you know, now that someone might have this ability to live and work from anywhere, where do you go? <laughs> you know, when the world is at your fingertips, where do you decide to go? And and I think for you, you know, you just made the move from Canada. Both of us were living in Vancouver yeah. pretty much all throughout COVID. And you recently decided to make the move back to Mexico. I know you've seen a lot of people, our team members included, who have also been embracing the remote work lifestyle there. Yeah, it's been really cool to see. Like I came down to Mexico, down to Playa del Carmen. And while I have been here before, I still took the same approach to evaluating whether or not I wanted to go down to Playa. And we'll definitely get into that and sort of like how you make a decision on that. But what once I was here, what I found so cool is there is a huge community of people doing just that, that people are working for companies. They're not just business owners. There's also still lots of business owners as well here, but lots of people working remotely and starting their you know work and travel journey. And that has been so cool to see because I know before we started out eight years ago, the community 
community here specifically, it was so small, it was just so small. And now you walk out and the cafes are filled with people working on their laptops. The co-working spaces are filled here. And I just think that to see that transition for us having done this for so long and to see people they're seem so fulfilled. They're so happy. They're so like excited to be able to do both and not have to do one or the other. And that's been really cool to see how many people have embraced that and are doing it now. I love it. I think for someone who's listening, that's like, oh my gosh, that sounds like a huge move Mm. to make. Again, speaking of moves, you know, deciding to pick up and leave your country, wherever you're from and go to a different country to work. It sounds like this big, overwhelming idea task. It seems Mm. like there's lots of you know, nitty gritty things involved. And so one of the things that we wanted to talk about is getting into a little bit about how easy it actually is. And one of the things that you're most likely going to be doing is you're going to just be trying to travel to a place, maybe for you long-term means one to three months. And as you're in this new, let's say you're deciding to go to a new country, as you're in this new country, you're still going to be on a tourist visa typically because you're not getting a local job. You still have your company back in, again, if you do run your own business, you have your company registered wherever you're from. You're still doing business from your home country technically you're just doing it remotely from a different country. And so the big thing with visas is that you're not taking work mm-hmm. away from the local economy and from local residents. But we've also seen even in the last 2 years this idea of digital nomad visas pop up yes. which has been really cool mm-hmm. and I've seen this pop up more and more in the last few months. I know places like Cape Town, Barbados, lots of countries are actually offering a unique visa for people who are working remotely and not just giving this opportunity, but actually welcoming people with open arms saying, please come and add to our local economy and please get to know the culture and work from here. And I think that's an amazing change that you and I have seen in the last decade of remote work where prior it was still this really foreign, you know, pun intended, really, it was still a really foreign idea to work remotely from your laptop, like from your home country, but in a different country. And there's quite a lot of gray areas there. And so I think for someone who's considering, you know, making this move, recognizing that you can go for one month to three months, and that's not a set timeline, but, you know, giving yourself the opportunity to try a different place out and recognizing that you're still going under typically a tourist visa because you're not actually working in the local economy. Mm, That's such a great point. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. And I think some of the shift that I've seen just from talking to people who are locals in the area, I think the locals and the governments are really embracing the fact that we aren't taking jobs away from local people, but we are stimulating the economy in a different way than a traditional Mm -hmm. tourist stimulates the economy. A lot of times people working for a longer period of time, say one to three months, are to actually embrace the local culture, learn the languages, and really get integrated in the community here and be an active part, whether that's through giving back or through just joining in in living the way that the locals live. And I think that's why the perception has changed. You know, I think that before it had a really negative perception against, you know, that typical tourist that comes in for a vacation mode. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think the visas are popping up more frequently because globally we've embraced this new work and travel lifestyle and we're becoming like positive contributing members of a new community of a new country. And I think it's really cool to see that bureaucracy change in favor of having a more like global citizenship in a sense. Yeah. I love that. That's so well said. And the other thing we've seen is that there are now compared to back when we started in 2013, there are now so many more tools that make remote work easier, so much more effective. Back in the day, they were few and far between, and we kind of had to hack our way around making remote work for us. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, so many tools, I think someone who is already working remotely, maybe you're just working from home right now. You've probably seen all of these different tools come up, especially if you transitioned from being in office now to working remotely. 
but some of our favorite tools, which you call the trifecta. <laughs> yes. I love to call these three tools, the trifecta of online, like basically online management and communication, because this is really the core of how you get business done. And I think this was actually the core of what a lot of companies were afraid was not going to be able to work. And essentially, are people going to continue to meet deadlines? Are people going to be able to see and know what they're working on? And then lastly, am I ever going to be able to easily communicate just like walking into the office um, or next to the water cooler? And so the trifecta of tools, as I like to call them, is Slack and that's like an instant messaging tool um, where you can have different channels based on different topics in like an instant way to connect with someone. Uh, there's a sauna, which is more of a project management where you have tasks and deadlines and you can still have some communications in there and it connects out to a lot of different tools, which is great. And then of course there's Zoom. To me, I feel like everyone is familiar with Zoom, but I have been told that not everyone is familiar <laughs> with Zoom, but it is the video conferencing tool that completely blew up in 2020. And those are the three trifectas for, you know, being able to, work online essentially. Yeah. I think for anything, you know, if you're listening and you're like, would I be able to do this remotely? I think if you just like Google virtual X, Y, Z, whatever it is you're trying to find, most likely nowadays there is a tool that exists. I have seen this just in my own personal life recently. I actually had someone ask me to send them a fax and I was like, oh my goodness. Hello (laughs) nineties. Like we need a fax machine. Where do you even go to fax something? I Google virtual fax and voila, hello fax. And again, this is not sponsored by hello fax, but Hello Facts, if you're listening, Hello Facts and Hello Sign, you can actually like virtually send a fax. Like you don't need to go somewhere. And this tool just allows you to upload a PDF and fax it to another fax machine. Mind blown. And same for Hello Sign, which you and I use so frequently because think about how many times someone asks you to sign a document. And now you're thinking, I have to like actually print this piece of paper no one has a printer. You and I don't even have a printer and like we have home offices. If they could get a printer, sign it, then go again, scan it, fax it, or email it to someone like what a process. <laughs> so there's some amazing tools like hello scan. I've recently found Adobe scan as well. I think Adobe has been coming out with some really amazing products. And so if you have, let's say a document or a piece of paper that you need to email to someone, instead of needing to go somewhere to scan it, on like a scanner. You just take a photo with your phone and it digitizes the entire document. And you can, again, use hello sign to fill it in, sign whatever you need and voila, off you go. (laughs) So it's so, so amazing. And Even in the early days, you and I use some other virtual tools, like being able to open a virtual mailbox, for example, or being able to have a conversation with a lawyer in order to open a bank account and doing all of that virtually. There's so many different tools. And so I would encourage you, you know, if you're going to be working remotely and you're worried about how you're going to execute some tasks that are on your plate, or maybe even just things in your personal daily life that you're like, how am I going to be able to do this while I'm not here in my hometown? I really encourage you to check out some of these tools that we're talking about now, but also Google and find some of these incredible tools that I think are going to be total game changers for you while you're working remotely. So Back to our original first question is where the heck do you go (laughs) now that the world is at your fingertips? Now you have these, you know, amazing remote work tools that you are aware of. How do you decide where to go? And I think back in the day, you and I were like, it's pretty much as simple as just like spinning a globe and closing our eyes (laughs) and putting our finger and like, let's see where the world takes us. (laughs) And while that does sound like a really adventurous idea, and you can still do that 10 years in, we actually recommend that there are a handful of things that you really should be using and thinking about as you're evaluating uh, a destination. And I think 
for someone who's listening, Shay, and they're, you know, having this fear of like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go somewhere that I've never been before. And that can seem really overwhelming, especially if you're Mm -hmm. someone who hasn't traveled much. And this conversation is still very much for you. We have lots of women in our community who decided to work remotely and travel to a different country and work remotely who had not traveled that much. And Mm -hmm. I think that's still totally amazing. Like you're in the right place to be able to, you know, start your journey of getting to know different places and different cultures, but Googling can be super confusing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think there's just so much when you, especially now you type into Google, like how to pick a place, where should I go? And I just think that it's just not really going to help you narrow down the answers that you're looking for, because everybody is going to have their own opinion on where to go. And I really think there's a couple handful of factors that you should consider when picking a place. And then you can focus on doing your research around those specific things. And then also taking into consideration, where do you want to go? Like, where do you feel uh, like called to go? Do you like tropical weather? Do you like colder weather? Do you want to learn a specific language and immerse yourself? So I think there's some more typical things to ask when it comes to things like Wi-Fi speed and how to find an apartment and that kind of stuff. And then I also think that there's other things to just figure out what is going to work for you in your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I love that you brought that up because I think Google is still if you're Googling a certain location, let's say for you, Playa del Carmen, Mexico, the majority of blog posts that are going to come up are going to be, you know, maybe blogs that are focused on vacation Mm. tips, the best hotels and resorts to stay at, you know, the best adventures. And while those things are still great for when you are on the ground and you're going to want to take advantage of adventures and try out the restaurants, like you're probably considering like, how do I just do life in this different country? And I I think that's where well, isn't really your best friend when it comes to kind of really laying the foundation for you traveling to a certain location, a certain place or country and being able to work remotely. One of our favorite tools that has actually been around for quite a long time. And it is a website called nomadlist.com. And this is essentially a a website or a hub that has been curated by digital nomads. So people who are working remotely while traveling, and it actually ranks the top, what they call digital nomad destinations based off of quite a lot of different metrics, right? Like safety, co-working spaces, cost of living, um, Wi-Fi speeds. Yeah. What I love about this site is that it's actually kept up to date. Like they've been around now for quite a few years and we use them, I think when they first came out and when I actually used it recently, when I was coming down to Playa and I did notice that it is kept quite up to date and quite accurate in terms of things, especially cost of living. So I focus a lot on that site on trying to find out what the cost of living is, is it going to meet within the budgets that I have or the budgets that you would have with whatever salary that you're making? You got to think about that kind of stuff. And I think that what's great about Nomad List is that something like that metric changes over time. And Nomad List has such a wide community of active members that participate and keep these sort of things updated. Mm, Yep. I love that. It's very handy because I mean, as you know, there are I don't even know the exact number at this point because I'm sure it's like quadrupled just in the last year, but there are so many digital nomads roaming the world, traveling and working remotely. And so what I love about this site is that it's basically taking all of that advice and expertise, putting it into a a website, which like we talked about is a resource that's few and far between, I think in this, you know, world, so to speak. And Mm -hmm. it allows us to evaluate a destination destination off of a handful of really important things that you and I look at. Now, I will say that we use nomad list kind of as a starting point, but then we do actually make sure to even further research each of these different metrics for a lack of a better word. Sounds so aggressive. <laughs> such a business term, but each of these different, like, you know, important points that you want to consider when you're eating a destination. So I think the first and most important is your Wi-Fi speeds. Um, 
if you are going to be taking your laptop on the road and you obviously have responsibilities, work to upkeep, you need to make sure that wherever it is that you're going is going to have Wi-Fi speeds that are high enough for you to be able to download mm-hmm. and upload, do your Zoom calls effectively, and you're not constantly dropping calls or struggling to connect. And I know that if you're listening, you might be like, well, hello, duh. Like, obviously I need Wi-Fi, but I will tell you after years and years in this industry, Shay and I see this all the time. Someone just decides to, like I said, go the adventurous route, maybe spin a globe and end up in a completely remote destination without access to Wi-Fi. And there are lots of incredible destinations around the world, islands that are Mm -hmm. going to be too remote to effectively work. And so I think it's a really important thing to, to pay attention to because as you're traveling and working remotely, you still have responsibilities to upkeep, whether it is working on your own business and working for clients, or if you're an employee and you're working for a company, that is what is, of course, funding your travels. It is your responsibility. It is your career. And at this, you know, point in time in 2021, it is not going to be okay to just decide to go to a super remote destination on an island in the middle of nowhere and be like, oops, I didn't realize I don't have Wi-Fi for the next month. (laughs) It's just not going to cut it. I think it's actually also from even the conversations I've been having here, one of the most stressful things, like not to make it sound dramatic, like I get that it's like, there's Wi-Fi everywhere. But trust me, when you are trying to get on a Zoom call and it is loading or someone's like, I can't hear you. I can tell you from firsthand experience, it's super frustrating because it is to you, especially if, you know, just coming um, from Canada, I never had any issues with my Wi-Fi there. And I got so used to that, but, you know, we had been traveling for so long. I, I got used to this, you know, more first world country style internet. And, you know, now I'm in Mexico and it's happened a few times here. And luckily, you know, what, because I chose a place that has access to co-working spaces that has access to cafes, I can figure out where the best Wi-Fi is to go to. I don't have to just rely on my apartment Wi-Fi. Whereas back home, you're not really thinking about that. If you're, you know, coming from somewhere where you've never had to really be worried about your Wi-Fi at home, it is something to consider. And I do think that some people kind of overlook that because we sort of take it for granted a little bit in terms of it's just always there. Right. And I think that that is something that is definitely important to evaluate and a way to do that is actually nomad list does do has that as one of their factors. They take the average of pretty much the city that doesn't, you know, factor in certain like co-working spaces or your apartment, but at least you can get kind of like a comparison just you could even look at your own hometown I think I did that I think I looked at my own hometown Vancouver and I looked at Playa just to kind of get a gauge of like what the average was and what the difference was there and I thought that was really helpful And then when we're talking about other things to look for, you know, looking for, is that area populated with cafes that people are working from? Is that area populated with co-working spaces that people are working from? And then what are the reviews on their Wi-Fi? You can always find those reviews now. And which is like crazy because I never used to go find those reviews. We'd always be like digging through the Yelp and the Google reviews. Now it's one of the first things that people talk about for, you know, cafes, of course, co-working space, but for cafes specifically, which has been so helpful. And I think the way that I do that is using Pinterest, you know, actually find some blogs. Like there's so many people writing about remote work. And we talked about how Google to me just can be a little bit of a mismatch of everything. And so finding some blogs on people working remotely and then asking those specific questions around co working spaces and cafes, really doing your research on the area that you're going to instead of just spinning that globe and picking a place is going to be another thing that you should use to evaluate whether or not you want to go there. Mm -hmm. And there's an amazing tool. It's free and super simple called speedtest.net. If you want to test your Wi-Fi speeds, you do have to be in the, like connected to the Wi-Fi that you're testing. However, you can always have someone test it for you. If you're not in the location, I was recently told that Airbnb is now putting Wi-Fi speed tests on a lot of their Airbnb rentals because they've obviously seen a huge uptick in people, you know, 
wanting to rent Airbnbs because they're working remotely. And so I think that's amazing too. Another remote work win, because before it's really a hit or miss, you're kind of just a, a token of faith and seeing how your Wi-Fi is going to turn out. And so we talked about the cost of living. So those are going to be, you know, just how much is it going to cost for you to live in this place? What is the typical cost of an apartment of food of a cup of coffee? And if you are deciding to travel from a first world country to a third world country, I think you are going to be pretty happily surprised to see how much lower the cost of living is in a lot of these places. Typically your cup of coffee might be a quarter or even half of what it was in a first world country. So we think that's always really helpful. Again, of course, a gauge, and it is going to depend on where it is that you are actually, let's say eating out at, for example, you know, in a lot of the third world countries, Shay, that you and I have lived in, there is a wide range, of course, of eating super locally and being able to eat on the cheap Mm -hmm. and then Mm -hmm. going to, you know, high-end restaurants where you're going to be spending pretty much the same amount of money that you would in a first world country, either back in Vancouver or for me back in LA. And so that is something to pay attention to. Don't just expect to go somewhere and assume that everything is going to be inexpensive. If you're going from a first world to a third world country, there is going to be quite a big range in third world countries of resources that you can get of inexpensive apartments to extremely expensive apartments, at least for the local cost of living. So I think that's an important thing to remember. That's so interesting that you brought that up because that's actually, I want to say like the first or second thing that people say to me as they're working remotely and that here in Playa del Carmen in Mexico, I think they just really, again, they they didn't really do their research, but I think people have a really big misconception around cost of living when it comes to what it is that you're eating or doing or how you're living. So I find it really interesting because like, yes, you could go to around the corner to the local taco stand and eat for like so cheap, like cheaper than you can even ever imagine living in a first world country. But the majority of times that's not really, you want to eat at the more quote unquote upscale restaurants or the nicer restaurants and the more like expat style restaurants. And you look at the locals aren't eating in those restaurants. So I think that it's definitely a culture shock maybe is the right word for it. I'm not sure what it is, but I think because you and I have been doing it for so long, it wasn't really anything new to me, but it has been these, these more new work, remote workers. Cost of living has been a huge topic of conversation here, especially when it comes to renting apartments. You know, you're, mm-hmm. if you want to rent something that's exactly the same as what you're renting back home, then it's definitely going to be cheaper than what you're renting back home, but it's not going to be these like ridiculously low cheap prices that I think people are kind of expecting. So it's more deciding on the lifestyle that you want to live, but just having that sort of understanding before you get here, I think is really helpful. And I think that's why doing your research before you can easily find that kind of stuff out through blog posts and Facebook groups, chatting with other people that are actually here living uh, that lifestyle, you know, and I think in third world countries, like you had already said, there's a huge range in terms of the type of lifestyle that you can live. This episode is brought to you by the Bucket List Bombshells Academy. Eight years ago, I left my uninspiring nine to five job and booked a one-way ticket to Mexico in pursuit of my own freedom-filled life. That led me to starting my own online graphic design studio where I had the freedom to work from anywhere, design my own schedule, and do work that I loved. All of a sudden, work became a source of excitement, and most importantly, I felt inspired to open up my laptop each day. The Bucket List Bombshells Academy is our comprehensive curriculum of online courses where we'll teach you the step-by-step of learning in-demand online skills and building your very own online business. Plus, you'll have support from us and our expert community igniters to guide you and answer your questions every step of the way. You don't have to have a business idea or even any idea of what you want to do next in your career. If you know you're ready to make a change and pursue your own freedom-filled life, we're here to help you take that next step. Join us in the Bucket List Bombshells Academy or learn more by visiting bucketlistbombshells.com slash academy. 
I think it's really important to, you know, there is a fine balance, like we're talking about, you know, we are visitors in a different country. And, you know, the big part of wanting to work remotely, at least for you and I and living in a different place is really getting to know and experience a different culture. That's one of the reasons why it was just such an amazing opportunity that you and I realized in the early days going on a one week vacation or a weekend vacation, right? Like we get to meet and know local people. We get to understand local customs, try the local food. And so I really, you know, I really, really would recommend for someone or those of you that are listening and you are going to a different place. A lot of us want to, you know, stay in our comfort zone still. So we get attracted to the Western restaurants, right? We get attracted to the Western ways of living, even in a third world country. And I think that, you know, while there is zero judgment ever on this podcast, but If you continue to do that all the time and you're living in a different country, you are majorly missing out on so much amazing local cuisine, local ways of living, local culture that you're missing out on if you're choosing to always be attracted to the Western lifestyle. And so- You know, I think there are some cities that are, have more of a Western influence than others. So this is really going to depend on where it is that you choose to go, but regardless of where you go, I think it's really important to branch out and recognize that this is the reason that you're also going to work remotely in a different country, right? If not, you could just stay, you could just stay where you're at. (laughs) And so, you know, maybe it does sound a little out of your comfort zone, especially if you don't speak the local language, for example, in Mexico to like go up to a taco stand and, you know, no one speaks English and you're like, I, I don't even know what these tacos are, but I'm going to try to order them. That is half the fun of working and traveling. And you and I, I have just hilarious memory of doing this in Thailand while we were living in Bangkok. And I guarantee you, the more that you step out of your comfort zone and you meet people, I think you really will find the local people are so welcoming and so excited to teach you and share with you the local culture. And so I just, I think that was an important kind of thing to talk about off of your conversation about cost of living. Cause I do think that there really is a balance there, but remember you're not going to a different country to, you know, for me, I'm not going to a different country to live a, you know, LA lifestyle, for example, or you weren't going from Vancouver to Mexico to live a Vancouver lifestyle in Mexico. That's just not really how it goes. And so I think when you can really embrace a different place for what the beauty is in that place. There's so much more opportunity for you. And speaking of general lifestyle and overall vibes, I do think that's important as well. You talked about it a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, are you someone who loves the mountains and loves the cold, or are you someone who really loves a tropical lifestyle? That was one of the big, one of the big things I looked at when Mm. I first decided to go to Bali. And we kind of talked about this a bit in our origin story podcast episode, but it was that I know that I absolutely love. I love a tropical lifestyle. I love living by the beach. I like, you know, spending my days with no shoes on and just like being able to be in the hot sun, open air. Like that is the vibes for me. And so one of the things that I did was I, speaking of Google, I Googled best co-working spaces around the world because at the time I knew it was really important that wherever I wanted to go and work remotely from, I really wanted to have a strong community of other people who are working remotely. And so of course, when you Google best co-working spaces in the world, there are so many different countries that fall into this list. But one of the places that really stood out to me was in Changu, Bali. And of course, they're kind of talking about the lifestyle that you can get SIE bowls. It's five minute walk to the beach that people are typically working and then surfing and doing yoga. And I was like, oh my goodness, like (laughs) I can see myself there. That sounds perfect. And so I really do think you want to consider, do you want to live a beach lifestyle? Are you more of, you know, a city person and you really love having 
you know, like architecture and museums and live music and, you know, the different types of things that a city can offer, then I think, you know, using that to kind of guide you first to finding at least some handful of general destinations that fit the lifestyle and vibe that you're wanting, and then being able to evaluate, okay, based off of those, what are the Wi-Fi speeds that are going to, you know, fit for me to effectively work? What is the cost of living? Does that match what I'm making? Are there co-working spaces and coffee shops in this area to be able to have a backup plan for Wi-Fi, but also to be able to meet people. One of the biggest ways that you and I have met people on the road, so to speak, is through co-working spaces. And we get this question quite a lot. And it was actually another suggestion for a podcast episode that was asking us, how, how do you make friends on the road? You know, mm-hmm. if you're constantly moving, how do you make friends? How do you establish community mm-hmm. and co-working spaces for us have been such a hub of other mm-hmm. people who are working remotely and such an easy way to get plugged into a local community and a network. And what you and I have found as well is a lot of these co-working spaces have connections to the local community. They have giving back programs that are connected to the local community or local startups or so many different ways that you can get involved. They are most often also connected to local culture. So they're celebrating the local culture and holidays. And we got to be a part of major holidays, for example, in Indonesia and Bali because of the co-working space that we were a part of. And I think that is something that wouldn't have been as easily Mm -hmm. done had we, you and I been working from our apartment in Bali, for example. And so I think that's another really important thing to look at, especially I would say for someone who's an extrovert, but also for introverts, you know, you're like, I just want to stay, <laughs> you know, in my little pod and just work for, like on my own, especially if you're deciding to travel on your own One of the best opportunities for mm-hmm. you to step out of your comfort zone. Even myself as a, I would consider myself a pretty big extrovert. It is, it was challenging to travel to Bali on my own and be like, I don't know anyone here. I don't have anyone to go out to eat with, but like, I need to, you know, (laughs) I need to go to dinner or like, I want to go to dinner on a Friday night. And I had this like, just amazing memory of going to this super cute restaurant in Bali, taking my Kindle and sitting there and being like, okay, like I'm going to take myself out to dinner because I don't know anyone yet. Right. And it's like, those are, that is part of the magic of solo travel of working Mm. remotely, of putting yourself in uncomfortable situations. Like that is where growth comes from. And we talk about this in other episodes, but I do think that working remotely and traveling is a really magical, but also challenging Mm -hmm. personal growth experience. And if you allow it to change you in that way, I think that there is so much amazing lessons to be learned personally, professionally from this entire experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really think that so much personal development has come or personal growth has come of working and traveling when you're pushed outside your comfort zones, which we have talked about in other episodes. And when you hit obstacles that you have to overcome and you build for me, I built a very big confidence muscle from solo traveling Mm -hmm. or even traveling with a friend, but just traveling in general in a foreign country. And I just remember, I have so many fond memories of that. And it's just it was so inspiring to me to like show other people the way to do that, but also to see that from my own personal growth. And I see that in so many other people. I love that. Well, I think a lot of what we're talking about now is kind of boiled down to telling someone to do their research. If you're listening and you're considering (laughs) working remotely and traveling, I do think that doing your research ahead of time is going to really not only ease your worries if you are worried about, you know, making the move, but also just really help you get prepared Mm -hmm. for wherever you're going, whenever you're going. Obviously you can't know 
everything. Like mm-hmm. we just said, part of the magic of the adventure in itself, but you can be prepared. Yeah. And I think some other really fantastic places and to find other resources are Facebook groups. Yeah. There are so many Facebook groups that are location specific to digital nomads and expats. And so I think if you are deciding to go to a specific location, if you're searching in Facebook groups and you type in, you know, for example, digital nomads, Playa del Carmen or expats, mm-hmm. Playa del Carmen, join these groups even mm-hmm. ahead of time, even if you're not hundred percent sure on this location and start to see the conversations, see the community that's already built up there. What kind of events are they hosting? What are the topics of conversation? And usually those are some of the best sources to be able to find apartments, find advice on areas to live, you know, working spaces and recommendations. And of course, even find some friends before you even hit the ground. Yeah, I think that's such a great point. Be like I've personally used the Facebook groups here in Playa for community, for events. And also if you're wondering too, when you're on the road and you need to get something, go to the doctor, go to the dentist, to like go do life things, or even just get your hair done, honestly. And you don't know where to go. Google sometimes isn't going to give you the best recommendations. The best recommendations that you're going to get are inside of these Facebook groups. So I really can't recommend those highly enough and joining them before you go is just such a great point just to reiterate what Cass had said there. You know, being able to find a place to stay is usually probably Mm. one of the biggest tasks of deciding to Mm -hmm. travel and you're like, okay, like where should I stay? If you're looking at a bigger city, you're like, what part of the city should I stay in? And like, we're, you know, continue to say like Google is not always your best friend when you are trying to research. And so Mm -hmm. I think, using the Facebook groups for sure. You and I recommend staying away from hostel, from hotels. Obviously hostels are typically for people who are on a super low budget, but who are also just backpacking and are not typically, Mm -hmm. you know, working while traveling. And so that can be really hard if people are like raving and partying all night and you're (laughs) trying to get up at 7am for a zoom call. Not exactly the best mix there. But if you're, you know, not really sure where you're going to book, it can be a little overwhelming to decide to, you know, rent a place while you're not there and you're doing everything virtually. And so typically what you and I do is find a temporary place to stay in the location that we're planning on staying for longer for roughly two weeks. I think one week is a little ambitious and too short for you to really like get your feet on the ground and get to know the place a little bit, ask for advice, be able to check out a handful of different places. And then, you know, of course, actually move in again, even if it's only for a month while you're there. And I think finding a long-term place on the ground is not only how you find a place that you are actually really going to like, but also that's a much better way to find pricing. Anytime that you are trying to rent an apartment virtually, I think we typically see prices Mm -hmm. sometimes even double or triple what they should be when your feet are on the ground. And I will say maps can be so deceiving if you don't know the area. I think Playa del Carmen is a great example Mm -hmm. or even Changu in Bali. If you were to look at the Changu Bali map and take yourself, you know, think maybe 20 minutes outside, doesn't seem that far. That is quite far from the center of Changu. It's not to say that it's not an area that you want to stay in, but if you think you're going to be super close or walking distance or, you know, right next door to the hub of Chenggu, it's not exactly the case. And Mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to know that unless you're actually there. So I really think, you know, just save yourself the headache, find a place for two weeks, even if it is a hotel or an Airbnb, and you are going to be paying a little bit higher for that week or two, but in the long run, you're going to be able to find a place that you really like that you've checked out that you've taken your computer to do your Wi-Fi speed test. And that, you know, is in an area that you like, I think a really important part of working remotely and traveling that is going to make you feel so much more comfortable and just take a lot of headache out of worrying about renting a place and getting there, not loving it. You and I have had multiple stories of this Mm -hmm. not working out exactly as planned. 
Yeah. And I want to touch on the point that you made about the area. I think that that was one of the biggest winners for me as well, because again, I don't really think like Google can really help you understand like the neighborhood, you know, like uh, the walkability of it, how many cafes or places that you want to go or nearby, you know, if you want a fitness studio or you want a cafe, or maybe in your research, you found these really cool, like bars and restaurants in this area. You want to make sure though, that when you're on the ground, it's just like that, that is the area that you want to be. in. that is the neighborhood, you know, take safety into consideration as well. And I think that's just a lot easier to do when you're on the ground. I think utilizing the Facebook groups to get some opinions, especially maybe for booking that first two weeks, you know, where should I book for walking distance and where's the right area, but then for yourself to really just walk around, honestly, a lot of the places that we found early on were from Cassie walking around the neighborhood and looking for rental signs or just really understanding what each neighborhood had to offer. And I just did the, that recently here. And actually to touch on the negotiation, I negotiated an apartment that was half of what it was posted for on Airbnb. I found it on Airbnb. And then I was able to like bike buy it and actually see where it was located and make sure that it was the neighborhood that I wanted. So I did a little like creeping, you know, rad by on my bike. <laughs> and then I was able to actually go and find the contact and meet with him in person and negotiate a longer term deal. So just from personal experience, I really think being on the ground for cost and for understanding the neighborhood and making sure that that is where you want to be is so helpful. And I've met people here And because I feel so familiar with the area and they're looking for a new place, I've been able to, as someone who's been here before and is here now, give them recommendations. And I think that's another great thing about being on the ground. Maybe you meet people at the co-working spaces or through the Facebook groups and the events, and you get another hands-on personal experience of each personal recommendation of each neighborhood, which I really feel like that has made a huge difference for us over the years. Yeah, you're totally right. I think too, one of the other big topics or questions that usually get gets asked to us in this whole conversation is like kind of the nitty gritty, like those people that are super type A and planners, like how do I get like all my ducks in a row, you know, Mm. like at home, like what does that look like? Right. And I do think in a flexible lifestyle like this, where you are working and traveling, there is a lot of flexibility. So it's not all the same. I wouldn't say that everyone who's Mm. working remotely is all doing the same thing at home. Right. And so what we want to talk about are a couple of different options Mm -hmm. that you have just to open your eyes. If you haven't already thought about it, or just give you some suggestions based off things that we've done. So one of the things, if I think you're planning on going somewhere for one month, three months would be subletting your apartment. If you're planning on coming back home, this is something that you have been doing in Vancouver. If you're planning on coming back home and you're just going for a short amount of time, then this could be a really great opportunity to sublet your apartment to a friend or to, you know, someone else, friend of a friend, someone that you might know so that you is obviously covered in your home and And then you have, you know, you can pay easily pay rent wherever it is that you're going. So that's super common. The other option that we see that's a little more all in quote unquote (laughs) for people who really know that they want to be on the road for a longer period of time. And maybe you don't have major ties back to your hometown and you kind of love the idea of having more freedom and not being down in that way when it comes to having an apartment back home, then you can always put your items or your things into a storage unit. Storage units are typically not that expensive, especially if you just need a small one. And then you can utilize services like virtual mail services that Mm -hmm. will actually collect your mail. So basically all your mail would be forwarded to this company. They would virtually scan everything for you. And then you could actually check your mail online, which is super cool. You can decide whether they like throw it away, whether they shred it, whether you need it to be forwarded to you, uh, wherever you're at or forwarded to, you know, maybe a family member or friend. So that logistically is an important thing to kind of, (laughs) to touch base on. Cause I know people are like, how do you do it? And how does that work? And the other big part of that too, speaking of logistics is banking. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, how, like, how do I get money out? I don't want to have, you know, transaction fees. So you want to kind of share a little bit about what we recommend when it comes to credit cards, debit cards, local Mm -hmm. currency. 
yeah. all that jazz. Yeah. I think when it comes to sort of banking and money, the first thing that I always like to recommend is having like a credit card and backup credit card as well. If possible, if you can't have two, that's fine. But with your credit card, making sure that you call them ahead of time. And some cards have this automatically where they don't have restrictions. But the last thing that you want is when you get to a new country and you try and use your card, that it gets blocked because your credit card company is trying to keep your finances safe. So Mm -hmm. it's always a good thing. Some of online banking actually like for example my card I can log into my online banking and just make that note I'm traveling and sometimes it lets me put in like where I'm even going so there is a lot I think around like that banks have done to implement different things like that another thing that I like the feature that I have too with my card is that I can log on or use the app on my phone for my banking and actually click a button that says lock card and that means no one can use it until I unlock it again as well that's just something for those of you who might be concerned about your credit card traveling. I know that that's something people bring up. And now I think a lot of banks have accommodated for that. So definitely making sure that you have an active credit card. And I personally always like to have a backup active credit card as well. And then the second part is your debit card. You also probably will need to call your debit card company as well. Let them know you're traveling. Let them know where you're going. That one usually has higher security than your credit cards. Definitely, I've had friends run into issues with that. So call ahead of time. And again, my debit card also has a lock feature so that I only unlock it when I'm actually going to an ATM to take out money because in Playa, it is a much more cash-based society, which is probably something that you will find when you go to most third world countries, they're usually primarily more of a cash-based society, which means you're probably going to be taking out and using your debit card at ATMs more often than you would back home. And so personally, just to avoid you know, any sort of bank fraud or having any sort of issues with that. I just like to lock my card when I'm not going to use it, when I'm not going to take out money, but you should definitely make sure you have an active debit card. And with both your debit card and your credit card, I've actually called my bank and spoken to my bank personally about how long I've been a member of banking with them. And I've gotten them to waive and remove all of my international fees. So whenever I use an ATM, I don't get charged international transaction fees. I think nowadays most credit cards don't have that, but I know a friend who had that on her credit card too, um, which is ridiculous. Call up your bank. And if you've been a longtime member, either ask them to waive the fees or some banks do offer a specific card that's meant for traveling and won't give you fees. That's actually what I had in the beginning when I was traveling and working remotely. And so I always look for that, or I would ask my bank. So you don't have to get those extra fees. And to sort of touch on that cash-based system of a lot of third world countries, one of my number one recommendations to anybody traveling and whether it's a cash-based society or not, is to make sure that you do take out some cash and have that on hand in the local currency. So either you can do that at your bank, like local bank branch, or if just take out some local cash. And when you're at uh, the airport, you can exchange it there and get the local currency. It's just going to be really handy when you're on the ground and you're getting that first taxi or you're going going out for your first meal and you don't know yet whether or not places are going to accept credit cards or debit cards or whatnot. So it's just really handy to have a couple hundred dollars on you in the local currency. Um, It's really just made that smoother from personal experience. So helpful. I think the last logistical piece is phone plans. And, Uh, you know, do you keep your phone plan at home? Do you get a local plan? Um, Again, Google can be super confusing. And at the end of the day, it's actually not that complicated. I think that typically the most feasible route, most inexpensive route is to go local and get a local SIM card. So you're just going to find the best local carrier and pay for a local SIM card as long as you're phone is unlocked, you'll just swap out your SIM card and voila, you're going to be able to have a local number, which can also be really helpful for just getting around in your area. There are, you know, different carriers maybe that do have plans that are made for traveling or for international trip. Typically, these are not long-term plans. Most of the plans that I've seen, at least in the States, for uh, phone carriers are usually just like, okay, you're going to go travel for a week, two weeks, you know, maybe a handful of weeks. And that's really what they're made for. Mm -hmm. So they don't typically love that you're using for an extended period of time. However, it is still possible. So for example, in the States, Verizon 
has a really high fee for using your uh, SIM card internationally. So for me, I don't think that's a smart option long-term. You're much better off going with a local SIM, but there are other carriers like T-Mobile, for example, who have international plans. Again, they're not super long-term, but they could be great for you for one month or even a handful of months. So if you already have a phone carrier back home, then you can always go into, you know, into the office or give them a call and find out what types of plans that they have. You want to make sure you're not getting charged or paying just like exorbitant fees for roaming fees, for calling fees, because at the end of the day, it's going to be so much more cost effective for you to just get a local SIM card. If it's going to cost you $5 a minute, every time you call home, not a great plan. So make sure that you kind of keep that in mind as you're deciding on phone plans. If you're deciding with a local SIM card, you can typically get that when you get into the airport at whatever country that you're going to. So you can either find the information desk or if, again, if you're doing your research and you find the best local carrier ahead of time, when you get to the airport of the destination that you're going to, you can simply just walk up to the booth and get a SIM card so you're already connected literally as soon as you land which is always really helpful if you're planning on grabbing an Uber, grabbing a taxi, getting around using Google Maps, et cetera. I think that's kind of the last piece of our like super logistical mm-hmm. <laughs> nitty gritty details. But I know that for a lot of you that are like, how does this actually work? What do you do with your apartment or house and phones and banks? Mm-hmm. I hope this has been super helpful. I know that you and I kind of wanted to briefly touch upon the fact that for many people listening, if you don't know anyone else who is traveling and working remotely, who has traveled and working worked remotely, this whole concept maybe seems totally crazy mm-hmm. if you're the only one thinking about doing this. And we just really want you to know you are not. There are so many people. And even again, I would say like, I've seen three times, four times the amount of people since 2021 choosing to grab their laptops, pack a suitcase and head out. This could be the perfect opportunity if you've always wanted to travel and you still have, you know, high responsibility with your career and you want to be able to do both and live this freedom filled lifestyle that we're all about. This could be an amazing opportunity for you to make it happen. And so I really hope that in this conversation, if there was logistical things uh, that were holding you back and you're like, how do I do this? How do I do that? Once you kind of see it all laid out, it actually doesn't seem as difficult as you might think. And for you and I, Shay, I think choosing to book our tickets way back in the day, even back in 2013, but all of the different countries and places that we've traveled from, they have been completely different seasons of our life and just their own stories in themselves. But I can honestly say every time we decided to do that, it has been one of the best decisions we ever made. And like we were chatting about earlier, a time and a period of major growth. Mm -hmm. There is so, so much to be learned while working remotely and traveling Mm -hmm. by experiencing different cultures, stepping out of your comfort zone. And there's nothing like going to a place that you've never been before and not speaking the language (laughs) and deciding that you want to be a part of the local culture for a while to really push you out of your comfort zone. So I hope this conversation helps you feel more prepared if you're planning on heading off an adventure with your laptop soon. The Freedom Build Live podcast is brought to you by The Bucket List Bombshells. It's hosted by me, Cassie Torresias, and my co-host, Shay Brown. If you loved today's episode, we'd be so grateful if you left us a review. Reviews help us spread the word about the Freedom Build Life podcast, and they're a key part of sharing this show with other women who believe they're made for more. Until next week, keep on pursuing your own freedom-filled life.